If I was going to summarize what the Sermon on the Mount is, is it's a description of what it means to be a Christian. It's a description of the Christian life. And that's really significant for us to study because there's a lot of people nowadays that are trying to uh, explain or teach a certain thing about what it means to be a Christian, right? So uh, for a long time in church history, there's just one Catholic church and then the uh, Catholic church like uh, split with the Reformation. And then from the Reformation, you get, uh, I think it's a, a glorious and great good thing. But from that Reformation, you get a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas about what it means to act like a Christian and live like a Christian and walk like a Christian. And as a result of that, you could go to a lot of churches here in town and get a lot of different messages about what it means to walk this, walk this life, right? There's the prosperity gospel message, which is uh, to be a Christian is to live the good life, right? It's to have all the money you can want and all the cars and all the things, and you reign in life now because Jesus uh, conquered victory for you materially, right? That's a message that you'll hear of what it means to be a Christian. There's the ascetic uh, life, which means harsh treatment of the body, which means you, you know, to be a Christian means you have to, uh, you, you know, deny every good thing in the world and you just have to walk in self abnegation. That's a message. There's a legalistic doctrine. There's a, uh, you know, an antinomian doctrine. There's, there's all kinds of ideas about there, is the point of what does it look like? What does it mean to be a Christian? And, and, and I am just so grateful, right, that we have the Word of God to go back to. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if, if we didn't have this, I just have to close my eyes. Okay, I hope that guy's right. I'm gonna, <laughs> their music's good. He's charismatic. I'm just going to, they have great cookies. I'm going to go there, right? Man, but if it, because we have the Word of God, right? Because we have something that hasn't changed for 2,000 years, we can go back to what uh, our, the founder of our faith, Jesus, what, what did he say it means to be a Christian, right? And so I jokingly said, half jokingly said, we're going to title this series, right? The uh, uh, Vintage uh, Christian Life. Right? Do you remember that? Like, what does the original, what did Jesus say and pray that we as a church embody that? And then we just thought about, we dreamed a little bit about what it would look like for a group of people to actually live this out. Man, what would it look like for us as a group of people to say, okay, this is what Jesus says, and I want to just come underneath my Lord and Savior, and I want to live this way. And I think we really would shine like lights on a hill, like Matthew 5 talks about. Right? Uh, I told a brief story about communism and how communism g uh, grew in popularity because, right, why, why did this, this thing that really doesn't work and it, it destroys countries, why, did, why was it so successful? Why were so many people enamored with this worldview, with this way of living? And it's because young people especially, they saw people willing to give up their money. They saw people willing to give up their way of life and a lot of people that even willing to die to advance this cause. And that was communism, guys. And so it grew and it grew and it grew. How much more Christians, right? How much more can we bring the kingdom of God, right, to bear on this world by following Jesus and, and by saying, you know what, this is worth it. And that's it. Guys, this is a drum. You're going to hear me pound until the day I die, Lord willing, that if this is true, right, if Jesus really did die and raise from the dead, if he really is God, if it's true, and that's a big if, but if you've settled in your mind, I think it's true, then what that, that has massive implications. It means it's worth everything, right? You have to give your life to something. All of us have to, you, at the end of your life, when you die, your tombstone, right, will be able to say, this person, insert your name, lived for, fill in the blank. You, you don't have a choice. You will live for something. And if this is true, right, then, then man, I, I want to live for Jesus, I want to live for eternity. I want my life to matter, right? I want to, uh, I want to invest it. I, want, I just want to live for these things that are here and then they're gone, right? I want to live for things that don't matter. I want to live for Jesus. So now we have to ask, how do I do that, <laughs> right? I want to live for you, Jesus. How do I do that? And, and out of that was born this series on the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to look, we're going to investigate, we're going to see what does Jesus himself say. And right now, this morning, we're in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. We're kicking off the Beatitudes, and we're just going to cover one or two Beatitudes a Sunday. And, and this first Beatitude is so pivotal to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to spend uh, this whole Sunday on it, okay? So read with me. This is Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. It'll be a quick reading here. Blessed, this is Jesus talking, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord for help. Father, we, um, we just want to know you. God, we, uh, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care about what anybody um, 
tries to tell us in one sense, God, I want to be wise. I want to hear counsel. I want to receive that. But at the end of the day, God, I just want to, I want to be faithful to you, Lord. I'm going to stand. I'm going to give an account to you someday, God. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'd help me to faithfully teach your word this morning. Uh, if there's anything I'm not supposed to say, Lord, you stop up my mouth. God, I pray that you'd open up hearts and ears to hear this morning. And God, above all, we just pray, would you convict us? Lord, would you lead us to bring our lives into conformity with the Sermon on the Mount, God? Oh, Lord, whatever idols, whatever things that we're hanging on to, whatever ways that we're uh, just not walking as we ought to, Lord, would you reveal that? And would you help us? And would you begin that? Would you begin that work this morning? God, make us a holy church, we pray. Amen. Amen. So the first thing uh, that we need to do is uh, I need to convince you guys, I think, first off, of what the Beatitudes are and how to apply them, okay? So most of my Christian life, as I read the Beatitudes, I thought of them kind of like the spiritual gifts. I thought some people are poor in spirit, and that's really good for them, right? Some people are the peacemakers, and other people are not. Other Christians are not. Some uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, that's their thing. They hunger and thirst for, and, and others don't. And uh, through the reading, I give credit to uh, a, a pastor named Martin Lloyd-Jones. He really just opened this up for me, and he, um, he challenged me in my thinking, saying that, no, this is actually uh, something that applies, A, to all Christians, and not only does it apply to all Christians, but every beatitude ought to be, uh, at least uh, to a certain degree, I'm not trying to say uh, you have to be a perfect Christian here, but to a certain degree manifested in the lives of every individual Christian. So let me try to prove that. So I became convinced of that when, when I went through and I just read all of the four statements. So let's just do that. Let's just read here. What, think about what are these four statements describing, right? If I just came to you and I said, hey, there's a certain group of people, starting in verse 3, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and they shall be comforted. That's verse 4. Go on to verse 5. They will inherit the earth. Uh, they will be satisfied. They will receive mercy. They will see God. There's a certain group of people. They will be called sons of God. And then uh, again, repeated, theirs is the kingdom of God. If I just said that to you, I, I, I bet you most of you people would say, and I said, who am I talking about? Who are those people? You would say Christians, right? Is that Christians are the ones that inherit the kingdom of God. Christians are the ones that are sons and daughters of God. Christians are the ones that are comforted by the grace and mercy of God. Christians, it's Christians, right? And, and so that's the first thing that started to get me think. oh, I think this is describing Christians in general, right? Not specific people or, or specific bends in your personality. Maybe you're a, a naturally a meek person. I, I, don't, I don't think that's what, uh, I don't think every naturally meek person, right, will inherit the earth. I don't, I don't think that's what the rest of the New Testament teaches. And so I started to do that, and I became uh, 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 convinced. Um, but not only that, but um, D.A. Carson points out that uh, whenever you see in your text, see how in verse 3 it says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and then that's repeated again in verse 10, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so the literary device there is called an inclusio, okay? You're going to learn a new word here today, inclusio, okay? I don't, uh, I don't know if it's Greek or Latin or whatever, but anyways, that's what it's called. And it means everything between those things is driving at the same point. That's usually how that literary device is used. It's a bookend. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and then there's all these things that are in between that go with that, and then he closes again. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think that's just more evidence that this is describing one life. Okay? And then I needed to be convinced that this is for every Christian, right? That, that we all ought to manifest some kind of poverty in spirit. That we all ought to mourn in one sense, right? What does that mean then, right? Uh, we all ought to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so I just went through my New Testament, and what I started to realize was that uh, every single one of these things, uh, I can find a command in the New Testament that's challenging specific Christians to live that way, right? That, like, like, for example, uh, the one we're in today, blessed are the poor in spirit. Man, I, I think of... Uh, Gosh, I, I think of, uh, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, what our Lord says. Uh, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. He who has forgiven much loves much, right? There's verses that go along with that. And I, and I won't spend too long on this. If you want these verses, I can give them to you. But for example, more in Romans 12, 9 says to hate what is evil and to hold fast to what is good. Meekness, Philippians 2, 3 says, consider others as better than yourself, hung hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Every exhortation in the Bible, which is a lot, to holy living. Do you see my point? Okay, so I, the reason I'm spending so much time on this, guys, is because I think it's really important uh, that we believe, okay, I think actually the Sermon on the Mount is meant to apply to me. <laughs> 
Do you get that? It, this is something, because as soon as you make that agreement, that this is what it's about, now all of a sudden you have to ask yourself the question, A, am I living? Does this describe me? A, am I poor in spirit? Right? Do I hunger and thirst for righteousness? Uh, do I, uh, am I a peacemaker? Am I merciful? Does that describe me? And if the answer is no, right, then it creates something in us. So, okay, I need to, I need to, uh, there's something wrong and there's something off in my spirit. There's something wrong in me and we can bring ourselves, now we're ready to approach it and bring ourselves under the conviction of God's word. We're able to obey. Does that make sense? Am I, you following with me? Okay. So this is really important. We understand that all of these Beatitudes apply to each of us individually. And so I just want to spend a brief moment then and just ask, okay, what does it mean then? If I'm supposed to be poor in spirit, what does it mean? Has anybody ever seen Monty Python on the Holy Grail? Anybody seen that? If you haven't, don't watch it. But if you have, I do this too often. I need to find better movies to quote. That, movies that I can say, go watch it. Um, but uh, there's this one scene in Monty Python, and, and they're actually, they're satirizing Christians. Uh, and, and what they're doing is there's this group of monks, they're walking around, and they're chanting. I don't know what they're chanting. Ma, mu, ma, mi, ba, bu, ba. And then they beat themselves in the face of the Bible. And then they keep walking, and they beat themselves in the face of the Bible. Have you seen that? That, that's what the world thinks of. That's what, when I say poverty of spirit, that's one of the images that's probably coming to their mind. And I'm saying that is absolutely not what I think the Bible is teaching here. It, it's not. It is not, not, not that we are walking around mopey. Uh, we're, we're, you know, why, this guy must be, you know, this horse must be a Christian. It has such a long face, right? That, that's not what it means to be a Christian. We are commanded. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> Right? We, guys, we are commanded to rejoice time and time again in the New Testament, which means that this poverty of spirit must be, it, it, it truly is a poverty, right? It really is a poorness, but somehow it produces joy in the Christian. It produces a, 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 a thanksgiving to God. It produces a, 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 just a happiness to be in Him. I'm okay using that word happiness. I think it's a fine word to use. So then what is this poor in spirit? I think maybe the best text that we've recently looked at as a church, we just went through Isaiah, is Isaiah 66 2, and it says, This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. In other words, poverty of spirit, I think, I think is, and I'd love to debate this with you, poverty of spirit is, is what happens to you uh, when you recognize what's always been true about you that you are absolutely bankrupt morally. That, that, that apart from Jesus, you really can't do anything. That's what his word tells you. We can't do anything. That Romans 1, right? This list of wickedness in Romans 1, and then you turn to Romans 2 and he says, who are you to judge them? You do the same things. It applies to every single one of us. That apart from Christ, our old man, every single one of us is so wicked, Right? Like, like the reason our lives don't turn out the way that we want them to is because we are, in one sense, unable to bring it about. We are poor in spirit. We, we don't have the ability, the moral ability, physically, right? Uh, uh, you know, theoretically, we all have the ability to live a perfect life. In theory, right? If I tell you don't steal, just don't steal. If I tell you don't lie, just don't lie. But we are so corrupted inwardly. This is what the Bible teaches. And this is, guys, this is a stark contrast to what our world teaches. We are so corrupted morally that we, we are unable to morally carry those things out. That's what poverty of spirit means. And, and just like I said a second ago, uh, I want to ask the question, okay, what hinders this poverty in us? What hinders it? It's, it's, it's a true thing. I'm going to make the argument. It's true of every single one of us, whether we recognize it or not. It's true of the guy that lives in this house and that house. It's true of the teachers in that school. We are all poverty. We all have this uh, inability to live the way we ought to. It's true of every single person. And yet, only some people recognize it and live in it. And, and those are, I, I would argue, people that really truly recognize it and live in it are Christians. This is part of what it means to be a Christian. And so what hinders it? Well, um, I, if I were going to rank the messages that were not going to blow up on YouTube that I've ever preached, this morning is one of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if, if I was, was going to give you a list, what are some of the Christian, do excuse me, Christian doctrines that just are not going to fly well <laughs> outside of these four walls? The idea that, you, uh, that the path to true joy 
The path to true life is poverty of spirit. This would be one of them. In other words, we are constantly, constantly being bombarded with a different message than this. I could, I could turn on the TV and any ad I pull up on the screen is going to say, you can be awesome, you can be great, you can be fantastic, just wear my watch. Right? You want to be a cool guy? Buy my car. Right? You want to be confident now? Just buy this product. Just do this thing. Live this way. And this is the tr path to true joy, true happiness. This is what our world is bombarding us with, guys. And I'm really passionate about this, actually, especially for our women in the church. Like, gosh, there is no other group, women, I'm just talking to you, this is true of men too, but I think specifically, women in the church, there is no other uh, group bombarded with this message than you, right? Even Christian literature, it's, it's always, you are enough, <laughs> you can do it, you're awesome, go get it, girl. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe I'm making a few of you uncomfortable, but I'm just reading my Bible, and I'm reading Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is, he's saying blessed. He's saying this is a good thing. And then I look up from reading my Bible and I look at the world and I just see something starkly different. Starkly different. And, and, and I think that, gosh, especially just you women, man, I just want to hit this point. I think um, radical feminism has come in and it's, it has made some claims, right, that, that because of the patriarchy and because of this oppression and because of these things, you need to pick yourself up and be a strong woman that don't need no man. Does that make sense? Like, that's the message you're receiving again and again and again and again. And again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you need to walk around beating your head with a Bible. I'm not saying think little of yourself, think that you're nothing, that you're just slime on the floor. I'm not saying that, right? I'm saying that that message is unbiblical. It's not biblical. And we're walking around, we're just drinking it in all day long. And then we wonder, and we wonder, why is my Christian walk so dull? Man, why when I read my Bible is it so boring? Why is my worship not producing life in me? It's because this world's message is antithetical to the Christian message. And guys, I'm just so passionate about this because the path to joy in your life, I, I believe this from the bottom of my heart, begins with being emptied. It, it begins with recognizing, you know, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm really not that awesome. Like, wouldn't that just be a relief to just say that for once? Like, I don't have to post on Instagram like my life is fantastic all the time. I, you know, I just confess, I can't do it. I can't be the perfect mom. I can't be the perfect husband. I can't be the perfect student because I'm not those things. And I would argue only the Christian can truly, truly say that. Uh, only the Christian can say that because we have as a foundation in our Christian life, hear me now, listen to this, please. If you tuned out, tune back in. We have as the foundation of our Christian life the, the, the cross standing as God's testimony to his love for us despite all of our wickedness and sin. How deep does your sin go? <laughs> you, you can't go deep enough that Jesus doesn't love you. He knew all of your sin before he died for you. Uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. And so as a foundation there, knowing, okay, fix this in my mind, my Jesus loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Not because of anything I've done. He just loves me. Now you are free Absolutely free to be honest with yourself. Oh man, I, I really am not as good as I thought I was. Oh man, when I blew up on my kids there, it wasn't just a mistake. I wanted to blow up on them. I wanted to be, I wanted them to pay. Oh man, when I said that to my spouse, what was inside of me was I wanted them to hurt. It wasn't just a slip of the tongue. No one, no one, no one ever makes a slip of the tongue. It's always intentional. And, and I'm saying if we as a group of people will face up to who we are, we'll look in the mirror and just say, man, you know what? I'm tired of striving. I'm tired of being good enough. I'm tired of trying to be this awesome person. I am bankrupt. Jesus is telling us, blessed are you if you're able to do that. Blessed are you if you're able to come to terms with your own sinfulness. Blessed are you if you're able to recognize what's already true of every person in this world, that you are poor in spirit, that you can't do it. And not only that, but John 3.19 says, the light came into the world and men loved darkness. Why do we do evil things? This is, this is, this is what's really hard. It's because we love evil in a certain sense. We love the wrong things. Until Jesus transforms our heart and gives us a new taste for him and to love him and to seek him, right? We love the wrong things. That's why we run after them. 
And the path to true joy is recognizing the depths of you. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, I will tell a story about a movie or a show that I do think you should go watch. Do you guys know? Uh, just to give an example of this, I just want to convince you here that true joy is on the other side of poverty of spirit. Have you guys ever, has anybody seen The Chosen? Anybody seen that? Hopefully, yeah, a few hands. It's so good. I recommend it. I, I think it's good. And, and the season one, episode one, is the best of the whole series. It's the best episode. It, I, I, I'm not trying to say they're not good, right? It's not like a sharp decrease. Okay, go watch them all. But the season one, episode one, is so good. Because there's this scene where Mary Magdalene, right, she's possessed by seven spirits and she's just like hiding in the barn and everyone like avoids her. She's kind of the disgusting one of the town. Everybody uh, wants to stay away from her. They're scared of her and she's just filled with evil, just filled with it, right? And, and there's this vision of this image of her and she's dirty and her hair's in her face and she's just like nobody wants to come near her. She's just absolutely the picture of evil. And the Pharisees come and they try to cast out this demon. They get scared and they run away. And then Jesus comes. <laughs> Jesus comes and he just picks her up. And it makes, it makes me, it's probably going to make my wife cry, right? It just makes me want to cry just thinking about it. He just loves her and he just casts out this wickedness, right? He just casts it out. And let me ask you, who is going to love and stick closer to Jesus than anybody? <laughs> it's going to be Mary Magdalene. Do you see that? Who's, who's going to have more joy than anybody that follows Jesus? It's the person that understands the depths of their sin, understands what they were saved out of. Do you see that? This is why true Christian joy is born in understanding your poverty. If you don't understand it, or if you refuse to believe all of your sin is just a mistake, if you just hide behind that veil, you will never receive the true Christian joy. Because Jesus died to save me. Yeah, he should. I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> right? Why wouldn't he die? I would want to be with me, right? Does that make sense? But true Christian joy, poverty of spirit, is born when we see the depths of our sin and it magnifies the love of God. Turn me to Luke chapter 6. There's a story that I think highlights this better than any other story. This is Luke chapter 6. I think it's Luke chapter 6. Oh no, it's not Luke chapter 6. One second. Let me find it in my notes. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. I'm going to read the whole story. I was only half joking when I said I felt like I had more time, so hang with me. One of the Pharisees asked him, being Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, okay, get that, who was a sinner, right? She uh, is poor in spirit. She is morally uh, bankrupt, right? She, when she learned that he, being Jesus, was reclined at the table, reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, this is in contrast, this is not seeing the brokenness of your spirit. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man, Jesus, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of a woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And guys, that's true. She is a sinner. It's true. He's not lying. And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered and said, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50, and when they both could not pay, he canceled the debt. Now, of which of them will, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Guys, who's the most blessed person in that room? Is it the Pharisee or is it the crazy woman when you're trying to have dinner that's washing your feet with her hair? Right? Think, think how weird that is. Think how desperate she must be to get to Jesus. Coming into a dinner party, imagine you're drinking coffee with a guy and somebody just falls down and starts washing and crying at your feet. How awkward is that? I mean, I know there's some cultural difference between us and them, but I have a feeling it was still pretty awkward. 
gosh, man, guys, she, uh, the point is she understood that she was a sinner. She understood it. The Pharisee, this is what we need to grasp, was no less of a sinful man. His heart was just as depraved. He just couldn't see it. You see that? He thought highly of himself. He made excuses for his sin. He made excuses for the anger that came up with him. He looked at all the great things in his life, all the money and all the house, all these things, and he said, God must be blessing me because I'm such a great person. And who was more blessed? The woman that's poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. We have an opportunity, church. We've got an opportunity here. We can be like that woman or we can be like the Pharisee. We, we, you have a choice, Right? And, 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 the, and the, what you need to do, what we need to do collectively as a body is we need to stop making excuses for our sin. We need, to, we need to long for this poverty. We need to say, Lord, just show me. Search my heart, Lord. Show me any unclean way within me. Reveal who I really am. We need to long to be like this because the more poor in spirit you are, the more radical Jesus' love is, the more joy and life and hope you're going to experience, right? He saved a sinner like me, right? This is where that joy comes in. It makes you want to skip and laugh and sing and dance out of a poverty of spirit that Jesus loves me like that. Oh, gosh. But if we continue to just make excuses, if we continue to say, I'm a good person, if we continue to believe that, man, we're not going to experience the height of this joy. I can remember there was one summer I was painting. I'm a painter, and, and I was just painting, and I just brainwashed myself with a sermon. I know, I probably shouldn't use that word. It probably freaks you out. I just listened to a sermon over and over and over again. It, it was called The Essence and Root of Sinning or something like that. It was by John Piper, and he was just basically digging into what sin really is. What is it? What's wrong with me? I just have this line in my, do I really know me? <laughs> do I really know what's inside of me to the point that the God-man has to die for me? Right? Like, like, do I understand how deep that goes? Do I understand that? And I just listened to it again and again and again because it was bitter to look at because it's sweet to go down. Like, you might be sitting here feeling like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to fess up to my sin. I don't want to own that. I don't want to dwell on that. It looks like it's no fun. It looks bitter. It looks, uh, guys, it's, it's bitter to look at, and then you drink it, and it's sweet as honey when it goes down. I don't know how else to explain it like that. But true Christian humility, our world kicks against it, chafes against it, hates it. But I can bet you ask many Christians in the room, there's not a lot of things better in our life than to be on our face before the God of the universe, like a little child, knowing that we hold his hand and he just he loves us like little children. Does that make sense? Mm. So I'm just, I'm just praying. I'm praying. I'm praying that we will be like that. That we'll be a church that's poor in spirit, that recognizes the depths of our sin, and in that, the height of God's love is revealed, right? And I think that can, uh, if you're not there, just let me, I know I'm going long, but hang with me. If you're not there, let me just give you a little hope, okay? If you want this, if this is something you desire, I want, I want to be humble. I want to be small before my God. That's the work of God's grace in your heart. If you find yourself pushing away, if you find yourself right now, I can't wait till he stops talking so I can get out the door. Okay, that just means that maybe God hasn't done a work in your heart yet. He hasn't showed himself as amazing and mighty and beautiful and wonderful, like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Just feel how small you are in front of him. But if you hunger for that, Man, there's so much hope for you. Even if you feel like you're not as humble as you ought to be, you're not as poor in spirit as you ought to be, this is something you can grow in. <laughs> it's not an either or. I think it happens when you're born again to an extent, and then you grow in it the rest of your life. Paul wrote, and, and, and it's First or Second Timothy, one of the last letters he ever wrote, he said, I am the chief. I am. I am now the chief among sinners. So the Christian life then is like you get saved and you see all these rocks, so to speak, on the ground, which represent sin. And you just start picking them up, right? The, the easy ones, the ones that are, you know, just stop doing that, stop getting drunk, stop, stop doing these things. And, and then you look around, okay, my life's pretty good. And then you see this boulder over there halfway in the ground. And you're like, oh no, I need to get that out, right? And it takes a long time and a lot of work, but you get this boulder unearthed and you're just hyped about it. You're like, okay. And you look around and things look pretty good. And, and, and then you look down and you see a layer of bedrock underneath that boulder. This is, this is what the Christian, and you just say, oh no. It's always been there. And I'm just now starting to say, maybe it's a bedrock of pride or a bedrock of vanity or a bedrock of selfishness, whatever it is, and you just start to hack away at it. By the grace of Jesus, you just start to hack away and say, humble me, Lord. 
Take away my sin, Lord, right? The most holy, most farthest along person in their Christian life, I would argue, is probably the one that mourns over their sin the most in this room. That would be my guess. As we grow as Christians, as we get more and more spiritual, what does Christian perfection look like? It is not, not, not that you become the most self-confident, awesome, radical Christian ever, and I want to be Superman like that guy. In my experience, at least, I'm a young man. The most godly men I've ever met are the men that just hate their sin the most, that see it the most clearly, that are just humble. Does that make sense? And I want to grow in that with you. God gave Paul a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being conceited, to keep him humble, right? This is something we can grow in through thanksgiving, through recognizing any good thing in our life as a gift from God, from trials. Gosh, guys, are you dealing with anxiety or depression? Are you dealing with death of a family member, just inability in your life? Maybe God's trying to drive you to your knees where you just finally say, I just can't do it, Lord. I can't be happy apart from you. I can't rejoice apart from you. I just, I'm, I'm bankrupt, Lord. I'm poor in spirit. Would you save me, Jesus? And that's a blessed, blessed place to be. God even uses our trials and hardships to drive us to our knees and produce joy of spirit in us. And then just to close here, guys, I just want to know, just think about, just imagine, gosh, just imagine a community like this. Like, imagine a community where all of us, we're considering the other person as be better than ourselves. <laughs> We have this deep humbleness about our, our spirit, right? There's a unity that's born out of that, right? We're not uh, fighting and devouring one another, and we just delight in the Savior that has saved us. That's how we're going to shine like lights on a hill. And I would even argue that this poverty in spirit is the key to unlocking the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. How are you going to turn the other cheek when someone smacks your face? By recognizing you're poor in spirit yourself. How are you going to not make promises you shouldn't make by recognizing I can't even turn one hair on my head white, right? How are you going to you know, do any of these things? How are you going to fast and not want everyone else to see you? It's by recognizing, man, I, I don't need any attention. I don't need anything on me. I don't need any praise. I am morally bankrupt. It's the key, I think, to unlocking all the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And we, be, we do really well not to forget that. We do well to walk in it. Amen? Amen. Hey, would you guys bow your head with me and let's pray. Father, we just ask you, Lord, I pray just for any souls that you did a work on this morning. God, anybody that in your mercy and kindness you convicted, that you brought low. God, we just pray that we wouldn't be like men and women that see ourselves in a mirror and then we leave and we forget, God. But instead, I just pray that you'd really transform us by your love. We're just thankful that you love sinners like us. Thank you that you saved me. God, that you loved me in the midst of all my sin, that you died for me, Jesus. Oh God, I, I just thank you, Lord. I pray you'd make us a people that are poor in spirit. I pray you'd make us a people that are humble and contrite and hard and tremble at your word. God, I pray that you'd make us a people that rejoice in who you are. We love you, God. Amen.